John Hodge, probably a name you might not have heard of, but if you've been in the business for any length of time, John Hodge and his incredible voice has had quite a journey in Christian music. Today, you're going to get a chance to meet John up close and personal on the CCM Legacy Cast, and we're going to get started right now. For those of you that have been tuning in regularly, this is the CCM Legacy Cast. My name is Chris Gaines, and I'm with my co-host and friend, Scott Galden. Scott, how Chris are Gaines. you holding up today? You, did you survive Thanksgiving? I survived Thanksgiving and was in the gym early this morning trying to work off the calories. So Very nice. doing the show best the, I can. So. Can you show me the guns then? Let me uh, see the no. guns. Are you good to go? <laughs> you don't do that? Okay. No. Right, well, we'll There's a ahead. reason you keep your gun concealed. Ah, well played. <laughs> Very well played. All right. So I've really been looking forward to introducing you to John Hodge. He was somebody that helped us along the way in the early days of Footloose. He hails from the uh, Longview area, and he had a band called Paradise. He and a bunch of really good guys from Longview would come down. They had probably one of the best sound systems in the area. And so we had them a lot. They would come down, bring their sound system, and would open for some of the top acts that we had. I got a chance to, to get to know John, and he's had quite a ride. He, moved, he and the band moved to Nashville and nice. got heavily involved in the music industry. And so I'm anxious to, to hear his story. And his band Paradise gave me the inspiration for my question for you. Besides Paradise, the Heavenly Gates, okay. your final destination, how would you define Paradise on Earth from your perspective? I know what your happy place is. Is that the same as your Paradise? It's pretty close. I got to tell you, my, my happy place and I may tell people more than they want to know, but my happy place is at the state final Texas high school football game and in and, and all of the big schools. That is, I just love that. And uh, we've got that date coming up here in a couple of weeks. I, I like to rent a suite and entertain friends and customers and stuff like that. And it's just a big day. You've been there, Chris. It's just, I don't know. It, it's like the perfect guy time. And uh, that's pretty close to paradise in my world. So. Awesome. Let's yeah. bring on John to our stage. John Hodge, amazing voice, great guy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for being a part of our show. Thanks for having me, Chris. It's a real honor. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. It's really been a long time, buddy. It has been. Out, so. I, you showed up on my phone. Actually, why don't you share the story of why you reached out to me in the first place? I thought that was creepy, but funny. <laughs> I heard you died. So there you go. I was cut to the chase. I was talking to somebody else that said, did you hear about Chris Gaines dying? I'm like, no, man, are you serious? So I was all bummed out, man. So I called Greg Oliver and I said, dude, what's up with Chris? I heard he died. And he goes, I hope not. I just talked to him this morning. And I'm like, well, did you have a seance? Or was this, did you talk to him on the phone? Were there candles involved? Uh, do we need to say a little prayer against you right now? But anyway. Now he said, no, I just talked to him this morning. So I'm right. like, well, I'm glad to hear that he's okay. Now, how do I get in touch with him? So, <laughs> Absolutely. He, so he called. Yeah. We have been playing catch up ever since, and it's been great just reminiscing. John has one of those voices that is extremely memorable, extremely special. And he really, he and his band Paradise put on some amazing shows. And so I'm just anxious to get you a chance to tell your story. Uh, obviously, this is a stage for artists like yourself to tell what was it like the road that you took the ups and the downs and the things that you learned and all that stuff. And one of the things I get real excited about is hearing from guys like yourself that really worked hard for a long time and learned a lot about the business, learned a lot about yourself, met some amazing people and kind of lived to tell about it. It all started when I was five years old. No, it, it was, uh... Let me go get on the couch. That's the second question, John. Wait on that one. We'll get there, okay? <laughs> uh, no, it was, I was born into a family of, of singers, and my dad ministered for 60 years. He went to heaven four years ago. He was 91 years old. My God. And uh, missed my pops. He was my hero. He was my Superman. Man, that guy was just amazing. And I always prayed that the Lord would uh, someday make me one of the biggest names in Christian music. And I should have been more specific because I put on so much weight with uh, 
being diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease a few years ago. Oh, wow. And my thyroid shut down and I put on 250 pounds. I'm definitely one of the biggest names in Christian music now, but <laughs> nobody knows who I am. But, you know, but uh, I'll be more specific next time. But um, anyway, no, I just, I had the greatest parents, man. My mom and dad were both good singers. My mom, gosh, she sounded like a cross between the Andrew sisters and, and Patsy Klein. She had a beautiful voice. Ooh. And I was always known for the dog whistle vocals and sessions and stuff. That's what Greg Bowles used to call me up saying, hey, Johnny, we need somebody to come in and do some dog whistle vocals. Can you handle it? I'm going to be out of town. And I'm like, sure, man. Thank you. So people ask me, how did you learn to sing so high? I said, well, I learned how to sing for my sisters. Oh. He just, nobody ever told me I couldn't do it. And so I just did it and. Then there was that operation, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, anyway. John, one question I, I like to ask is, at what age did you realize that you had a special talent as far as singing goes? What, what, what was the point where you go, I got something special here. I can use this. Mama always told me I was special, <laughs> but uh, I don't think that's what she meant. But no. anyway... She, uh, I think that was right after she tied the pork chop around my neck to get the dog to play with me. But, <laughs> but no, I just, I was probably, I started singing, dude, literally, I started singing before I could really talk well. And I think the first time I ever performed a song was, of course, at my dad's church. That's where we sang, because yeah. yeah. anything else was of the devil. We had to, it had to be, we had two types of music in our church, Southern and Gospel. Yeah. And so you just, you, you did that or, or you were basically getting a, a fast lane pass to the hot place. And, uh, <clears throat> but yeah, I was about three years old. Okay. I think I was maybe four when I did my first solo Okay. and uh, they had to put me wow. on a chair and I was skinny, believe it or not. I was really skinny back then. So they had to put me on a chair to where I could reach the microphone. And uh, that's not it. I was a really big four-year-old there. You know? okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I had a really weird disease, but it was the tie, man. That that actually, that shot was taken, I think, my freshman year in high school. But we had just moved to East Texas. I just kind of grew up with thinking maybe God was a little schizophrenic because he always called my dad to different churches. I was like, but you called him to the last church. When did you change your mind? But that's that's how you do it in certain circles. The yeah. Lord called me. Okay, so you identified the sins of the deacons. I get it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, we moved around a lot. So that was cool. That picture well, was right after we moved to East Texas. And, what were some oh, of your dude, early? Music I was hoping you'd ask that. Okay, that was a good question. I that's the one I always like to, to answer. I of course everybody says you know Russ Taft. And it was. The Imperials were a big... Uh, the Imperials were allowable in our home. Okay. Uh, I could listen to the Gaithers. They were not from the devil. So I could listen to them. I listened to Truth. They were borderline satanic in the, uh, the dom denominational movement that I was part of. But uh, I grew up fundamentally, fundamental. And uh, they uh, they pretty much, they would allow Truth. So I okay. listened to some of that Roger Breland Truth. And then, uh, gosh, man, I tell you, it's uh, I'd have to say the Imperials were one of my biggest influences. And of course, Jim Murray, holy Lord, see the fields. That guy has had such a pure, still has a pure voice. He's not dead. Yeah. But yeah, Russ Taft, huge influence on me. Wow. And then, of course, later, some of my later influence, of course, were, uh, I hope you see this, Greg. <laughs> anyway, but Greg acts false. <laughs> He'll probably never watch this. But yeah, Greg and I became good friends later. He was a big influence, the early Petra stuff. And, yeah. Oh, Brian Duncan, huge yeah. influence. Love me some Brian. He's, he and I have Absolutely. become good friends over the years. And so, yeah, just uh, that was it. How did much. you guys, how did you first get your band together? Were, were you all friends in high school or what, what was that? What was putting that band together like? You know, you're going to laugh. We actually met at a Rust Half concert in Lufkin, Texas. Okay. Uh, it was the it was the Never Ending Metals tour, and uh, he was there with David Meese. Mm -hmm. David Meese opened for him, and uh, man, I will never forget that show as long as I can live. I was probably third or fourth row back. He came out. Of course, he opened with this backlight on him. It's like this purple light with fog rolling off stage, and he opened with uh, a song off of Walls of Glass. Thine, O Lord, is the glory. 
that praise song that he did on there. It just, oh, dear Lord. It was like the heavens came down. It was so beautiful. And then immediately Hollahan kicks in it. Dun, 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 you know, inside look. And I was like, almost threw my underwear on stage. But, <laughs> but anyway, no, it was, I don't know if you could, y'all may not be able to use that. I'm sorry. Let's keep this. It fits place. right in with our personalities, but, um, John. Anyway, You're good. Um, okay. <laughs> Talk a little bit more about Paradise. How did Paradise form? And where did you guys start playing? Because I'm trying to remember, I guess I got your cassette sent to us and somehow we connected. But how did that whole formation begin? We started, I actually opened for Paradise. I did a little solo project, which we wound up using some of the songs off of that solo project on the Paradise record. But some of the stuff that I wrote, as a matter of fact, it's funny. My dad used to sit me down in the mornings before I went to school and he would say, now, son, this is like when I was second grade, first grade and all that. He'd say, son, now there's man will always disappoint you. I don't care who they are. Even I will disappoint you. I'm like, Oh no, not you. You're Jesus junior. But, but uh, even I can disappoint you. But he said, son, always keep your eyes on Jesus because he'll never disappoint you. And so I wrote a song called keeping my eyes on Jesus and wound up finagling Matthew Ward to come in and do a duet with me on that record. And uh, we wound up using it as a Paradise song, but it was actually originally recorded on my solo project. And so I opened for them, and they were in between. They were about to go through a transition with their former lead singer, Ronnie Ricks, which is an amazing musician. That guy can play everything, and he's a great singer. But he wanted to stay home, be with the family and stuff, so he left the road and they started auditioning people. I had opened for them during that period before then, and they said that they just, my name and face and voice kept coming back. And I was like, okay. So I went and auditioned in 1988 and uh, did a 90-day probation with a band. They, everybody, making sure everybody gets along and all that kind of good stuff. And after that, I was with the band until we disbanded in like 1991, I guess it was. That was the bomb, man. Now, that was a Tony Alamo shirt. Did y'all ever know that? That is Al- quite no, the mullet, no, too. Oh, my guy? God. Dude, I had the curly mullet, the ultimate. Well, yeah, that, 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 was was, your... that was our last photograph together as a band. Was it really? Wow. Yeah, that wasn't the early day. Is that? There's the album cover. Yeah, that was the last photo we did together. I sent you another one. I thought it had me in the early days, but uh, anyway, there it is. Now, there's, there it is. There's the Christmas sweater look. Yeah, it's like somebody had the brilliant idea of, hey, why don't we dress up in sweaters? <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have an ugly sweater. All I had was a members only jacket. <laughs> I love it. That's they put me in the back, but uh, like, yeah, I, was, I, I was, love that shot. That was, I yeah, love that. That was shot. just wow. It was just a baby. Yeah. You'd almost trust your daughter with one of those guys. Almost trust your daughter. I wouldn't with buy. One of those I wouldn't guys. buy a used. I wouldn't buy a used car from any of those no, guys. No. Nah. <laughs> we'll talk a so, little bit about that whole experience with Paradise, because obviously there was a lot of things other than Footloose, but but Footloose got you in front of a lot of the top Christian artists today. You guys went on to do a lot of stuff. Talk a little bit about what that was like and trying to get a record deal. We uh, we certainly uh, Footloose was our favorite gig. You guys always took such good care of us, and of course Leanne had that lasagna that was from heaven. <laughs> Let us pause for a moment and just think about that. But yeah, that was wonderful. And uh, anyway, yeah, we went on after. As a matter of fact, our last really good gig was at Footloose. That's where we mm. did our last gig together. It's Paradise. Mm. And uh, we had John Thorne touring with us at the time. He was playing bass for us. And he went on to play for, he was playing for Margaret at the time too, Margaret Becker. And then he went on to play for Whiteheart. He was the last bass player for Whiteheart. And then, oh, James Dillingham. You remember James? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was our guitarist. And he went on to play for Twyla Paris, Wayne Watson, a bunch of different artists. And, and he toured with Maggie too. But anyway... And then I got, actually, we opened for the Imperials on the Free the Fire Tour through Texas. And they were, at the time, they were, I think Hemby was thinking about leaving the band. And Slos, I was with Slos, his last gig with the Imperials. And uh, they interviewed me to uh, take one of those guys' place. And, and uh, they brought in David Robertson, I think was the guy's name took uh, Slos's place and then when Hemi was talking about leaving they talked to me and of course auditioned and everything and 
And then it turns out Hemby stayed. And then in 89, we got three first round Grammy nominations for Keeping Miles on Jesus, which was a song that I wrote and for the band. And, uh, and so it, uh, that took us to Nashville. We moved to Nashville and, and thought, Hey, with this kind of fresh fire, of course we didn't win. We didn't get any close to win. We didn't even make it to the final round, but BB and CC Winans won that year for the heaven record, which <laughs> was amazing. But any given morning we had half their band sleeping on our floor at our apartment because they were in between apartments. So we went on to uh, Nashville, and that's, that's where my whole story changed. Now, obviously, you were raised with a preacher for a father, so there may not have been a moment in your early years where you uh, all of a sudden accepted Jesus, but maybe you would mind telling us a little bit about what that, that was like. What was the point at which you decided to be a disciple or follower of Jesus? After seeing the Estes Perkle film, The Burning Hell, so and that's pretty much what it scared out of me. I was 11 years old. It was a summer, what we called a camp meeting. Yeah. And uh, so they gave the altar call and I was scared to death after seeing that film. And uh, <laughs> so I went and I prayed the prayer and signed the card. And then uh, the true test though of our Christianity back in those days is we had this little place. My dad was pastor in a little town next, close to Linden, Texas is where my cousin actually, all, all my family, my dad grew up there. He's born there and raised there. And a lot of my family's still there, but one of my cousins, Freddie Neese, played in a little band called the Four Speeds back in the 60s. It was Freddie Neese, a guy named Jerry Surratt that was killed in a motorcycle accident. It was let's see Richard Bowden from Pinkerton Bowden later. And then uh, their drummer was a little 15-year-old guy named Don Henley. He went on to have some band later. I don't know, the Falcons or... No, the Eagles. Yeah, that was oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> And, but yeah, so that was, but we had where you got baptized there is where I was going with this, where you got baptized. There's a little place called Pruitt Lake. Okay. And if Henley ever sees this, he'll know exactly where I'm talking about. But anyway, Pruitt Lake. And it was where you said in the name of the father, the son, snake, and everybody cleared. You know? so, <laughs> uh, that's where you could learn to, you could basically learn to walk on water or lily pads, you know, depends yeah. on what you hit. But uh, yeah, it was a scary spot. It's still there, man. The little boat ramp. We'd go down the boat ramp. Are, are you sure you believe, dude? If I didn't believe, my I'm behind would be in December. this nasty looking water. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was scary, but uh, I, I cut my teeth on a Baptist hymnal. So yeah. it's like, there wasn't really ever a time in my life I didn't believe. Yes. But quite honestly, it hasn't been until I'm talking about the last probably I don't know. 20 years that that I've just super fallen in love with God with Jesus all over again because of just events that took place in my life and hardships and you know it, it's like you learn so much more in the valleys than you do on the mountaintop you know? yeah. I remember I was on stage one night it was in Murfreesboro Tennessee it was 1991 and I had been asked to come sing back up for the Judds on their last concert together oh there I am look at there but uh, yeah, we did, um, they asked a few of us from Christ Church Choir to come out that night and, and sing backups for them. And I was a soloist with the choir at the time and I got called and that was just a really neat event. But it was like the Lord spoke to my heart. And we were singing for 34 million people on pay-per-view that night. And uh, it was a bit spooky when you're wearing a, a really long dress known as a choir robe. And I was scared to death I was going to trip on that thing and show off my bloomers. But, uh, but it was fortunate I didn't fall. I was standing there that night, and it was like the Lord spoke to my heart. He says, okay, you, one of your goals was to sing to millions of people, and you just did it. Now, let me ask you something. Would you rather do it for millions of people and not feel the anointing, or would you rather sing for 34 and know that my presence is there? And I said, God, ugh, I'll have my girl get back with your girl, and we'll do lunch. We'll talk about this, because... At the time, I was I was flying a pretty big high, but it just really brought everything down to into perspective. And it was fun. Listen, I enjoyed it. I would not trade it for any. It's a great memory. It's a great thing I can show and tell my grandkids about, which I've got eight grandkids now. So our sons, we have two sons that believe that it's their goal to uh, replenish the earth single handedly. But, Somebody's um, got to pay our anyway, social security. It gets kind of expensive at Christmas time. Yeah. <laughs> 
tell us a little bit of what it was like your first couple of days in Nashville. What do you remember <laughs> about, because I, I got to believe you probably thought you died and gone to heaven at that point. But. We had been going back and forth, honestly, Scott. We had been going back and forth to Nashville so much at this point. It's like we already lived there. It was like really a relief. We didn't have to travel from freaking Lufkin, Texas, man. That was a that was Beating. a haul, brother. Yeah. Things probably didn't take off with Paradise quite the way you might have dreamed at one point. Tell a little bit about that. How what were some of the struggles you guys were going through that might have prevented you from being able to get to the level that you might have really wished you you had? Mainly getting jacked around by A and R directors. The music business is not just Christian music. It's any genre of music. You're dealing with basically people that are pinheads. I'm going to be real nice and stay in my car. Oh, man, there's a funny picture. I'm seeing that picture rolling there, Chris. That was my first promo shot with Paradise, and my hair was much shorter there. But anyway, but yeah, that was and, – and oh, by the way, Captain Morgan there does not have his thumb in a precarious situation, <laughs> man, but it sure looks like – I have forgotten um, how ADD you are. I need to probably pull down some of these graphics. <laughs> I, will, I will be here all night. Hey, focus, listen, focus, I, will, focus. I, will, I will look to the – hey, you think I'm ADD? Wait till you interview Brian Duncan, man. Oh, my so, goodness. Rick I, Florian, dude, this those is guys. Of- it's scary, though, because we chime because we're off on the same rabbit trail together. It's like, oh, we're going this way? Okay, here we go. But anyway, but it's, yeah, it's, yeah. I did, somebody said, man, I'd hate to climb inside your head. I said, no, it's actually very entertaining, especially the theme of the Looney Tunes. You're playing constantly. But, uh, but no, but on a serious note, Scott, it was, uh, a lot of it was just jacking with, with the labels and stuff, man. It was, it was our, probably our biggest, I would say. And, and let me just put all this in perspective. Though. Sure. God has got a plan for you. And, and it doesn't matter how many idiots you have to deal with in the music business. It doesn't really matter. If God wants you somewhere, he's going to put you there. I I literally bawled when I watched that movie. I can only imagine because those boys in mercy me, their story. I don't know if you caught this, Chris, but their story was our story. It was just that they had the same uh, kind of challenges doing, Mm -hmm. uh, doing these uh, showcases and just, knocking it out of the park and the label comes back and says well, that was really good boys but uh, we'd like to see some more we're like dude we just hocked everything we had to put this one on how are we gonna afford to do this? Are you gonna pay for it oh no i will talk about this talk i told no, no, the lord will provide it sure will you go back to your fat salary and we'll just go eat beanie weenies for a couple months <laughs> but yeah it was feast or famine you know in that business yeah. i can't tell you man how many times when i first moved to nashville scott to answer your question I immediately got a gig working with Bash in the Code. And that was because Paradise was on a hiatus that turned into an eternal hiatus. But I uh, started working with Bash in the Code. And what a great bunch of guys. Man, I just, what, just fantastic people. And, and uh, we had some friends that had just moved to town. And it was uh, three guys that were had a little band that they had started. And, and they were just creaking into the business. And, and uh, they were broke busted and disgusted just like we all were they would come over and split pizzas with us we literally we would order a large pizza and everybody get one piece and everybody pitched in a buck whatever wow to to make it happen and uh, yeah that guy turned out to be one of just the the greatest influences to christian music today but uh really sweet guys toby and michael and kevin and uh, kevin was always a little eccentric but Michael was super friendly and Toby was just, man, just sweet. I love Toby to death. And uh, of course we knew him as Toby McKeon. I think ever the world knows him now as Toby Mack. But that was some of the guys that we hung out with in the early days and they were nobodies just like us. But I'm telling you, bro, when God has a plan for you to do something, you're going to do it no matter what. Yeah. That's proof positive. You just, an old man told me something early on in the Christian, in, in the music business. He said, son, the way to succeed in this business is just to hang in there and show up for the gig. He said, 99% of this is showing up for the gig. And I think it was Robert Plant that told Joe Elliott, he said, the way to succeed later on in life is to not get fat and keep your hair. So that's how you stay a rock star. <laughs> and uh, I've got a great head of hair. Really <laughs> what, what would you say we go through life? And obviously it, it seems to me like your faith probably had a big 
change. You went from a scare the hell out of you Christianity mm -hmm. to maybe a close relationship with Christ, something that was more real, more intimate, more mm -hmm. grace-filled. Could you talk a little bit about what that journey was? Was it was there a, a single point sure. where you really changed directions, or is it something that happened a little bit over time? It was a somewhat of a gradual thing, but, but what really affected me more than anything, and I'm skipping way far ahead, but 10 years ago, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was just, I was doing a little project for my wife or something, and I started feeling bad, and, and I, said, I said, honey, something's wrong, something's not right, and I'd been having some issues with my heart, but... She said, well, let me take your pulse. So she put one of those little pulse oximeters on me. And she said, oh, dear Lord, honey, your pulse is 180-something beats a minute. My and God. basically my heart was fluttering. And I went into AFib. And I dropped dead for six minutes. They called the uh, EMS. And they got there and, thank God, six minutes. You know, I mean, those guys responded quick. And they had to hit me four times with a uh, defibrillator because I was dead as a doornail. Mm. And... Uh, I was in a coma for three days after that. I was in ICU for two weeks. Uh, they had to put a pacemaker defibrillator in my chest. Uh, I was later diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is what brought all this on. And it's a very aggressive thyroid disease. And it can attack your heart, your lungs, everything else. But <clears throat> anyway, during that six minutes, guys, I experienced heaven. And... I didn't see it because I don't think God allowed me to see it yet because I would have said, I'm good. I'll just stay <laughs> because he wasn't done with me yet, yeah. but I heard it and I felt it. If that makes any sense. And uh, honestly, dying is probably the easiest thing I ever did. I just fell asleep and I was awake in heaven. And it was like, I felt completely immersed in love and acceptance and forgiveness. And I'll be honest with you, Scott and Chris, both that, that is probably the most, oh man, probably the most memorable point where I just had a complete epiphany and paradigm shift of who God was and who he is. And, and he wasn't mad at me. He loved me and accepted me. And that's exactly, man, that's exactly what I felt was that total complete acceptance and, and it was just it was incredible I mean, and there was music coming out of heaven that i've never heard these notes if that makes any sense but mm -hmm. there was notes in their scale there that we don't have and i that's the only way i can describe it it's hard to describe dude i i think that's why john was a little bit tongue-tied he's like oh yeah dude the, the gates of pearl and, and the streets of gold and and man it's, it's huge and, and, and he did the best he could oh. but it's indescribable man it, it's wow. pretty incredible so that was my big shift really and I, yeah how did your faith grow after that what was what were some of the next steps after that after that man i just i had a whole new understanding of who god really is and how much he really loves us and christianity in so many ways is just to drop the ball man you're preaching the gospel of fear and the gospel of God loves you so much that if you don't love him back, you're going to burn forever. And <laughs> and that, that's not real appeasing. I think that's what turns off so many atheists and stuff. It's like, how could a just God sentence a you know, Mother Teresa to hell or somebody like that? You know, how could he do that? You know? And man, I just, you know, I've done a deep dive. To answer your question, I, I've gotten in the word more and really searched out the scriptures. Gospel of the good news is Jesus. Jesus was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect life. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was viciously attacked, murdered by the religious crowd. And, but he rose again and he ascended to the father. That's the gospel. Yeah. And he washed away all of our sins, period. We used to sing all the song, Jesus paid it all. We should have been singing, Jesus paid almost everything, but you still have to do this and this. And that's <laughs> not the gospel, man. Jesus loves you so much. God loves you so much. He's not mad at you. Let me, let me tell you something, guys. That shook me. That shook me to my core. Yeah, because it was against everything I was raised to think and to feel and to believe. And I had some amazing conversations with my father, rest his soul, who he was 91 years old when he went to heaven. And my dad had studied the word. He was a pastor for 60 years and all this. And, and he told me one day, he's like, John, I'm going to tell you right now, if somebody goes down to the bank and they 
pay off your loan. Yeah, yeah. You've got to accept it. It's a gift, but you've got to accept it. I said, well, Dad, let me flip that around. Let me ask you something. If somebody paid off your loan, whether you accept it or not, is it still paid? Hmm. And I'm going to encourage everyone that's watching this. If you haven't seen The Chosen, watch every season, every episode of The Chosen. And that script is just nailing it, dude. Yeah. Jesus was real. He's still real. Yeah. And it's, that's what changed it, Scott. I just... I got a whole new understanding of who Jesus really is, man. Yeah. And his forgiveness is so real. Yeah. yeah. Well, so hey, real. hey, John, listen, let's, uh, I want to reset the table just a little bit. So you're, you've done the Nashville thing. You've done the, the record label thing. And that could, that was very frustrating at times. Let's talk a little bit about how that evolved. Cause at, at that point you started getting to know a lot more artists. Um, yeah. I've got this shot here. Tell me what's <laughs> going on at this time. Yeah. You connected with Greg. I want to say we had you open for Greg a couple of times and y'all connected. Yeah. I don't, yeah. And so obviously we, your, your voice has blended greatly. I, the genius that I was, I figured that would work well. Plus all your stuff helped with his technical writer. That was another subject, but you got to know him. <laughs> and, and so tell me about some of the folks you got to know and some of your experiences. And then as Paradise disbanded, what did you get left in Nashville? And that picture, that, that was a great memory right there. We had just shot a video and we were doing the come out fighting tour with Greg. We were opening for him on that tour. And of course, yeah, he liked us because we had all the nice gear and, uh, but no, we became good friends. In fact, I don't know if you remember this, Chris, but the last time we did a gig with Greg at Footloose, um, we had a rule in the band. Don't take phone calls before a concert. Just don't take phone calls. But my mom called and you know how that goes. If your mom calls, you better take it. Or you got to pick it up. You're That's cut right. out of the dinner next time. But anyway, so I took the call and she had told me about a, a really good friend of mine that we had gone separate ways, not over any disagreements. He just wanted to pursue some bad things and I wasn't game for it. So we had to split the sheet together, but he had committed suicide that, that day. Mm -hmm. And Greg was there when I got the call and his heart really went out to me and he could tell that it was, I was just devastated. I had to go out there and, and, and do our thing that night minister. And, and it was hard. It was tough. But uh, I cried the whole show and uh, Greg just really, I don't know his, he just, I think he just really, he had a soft heart toward that. And he took me under his wing and, and really encouraged me. And then we did some more gigs together after that. And then, so I get a phone call. I'm in Nashville. I get a phone call. <laughs> One day, and this is a great story. You'll enjoy this. I, I get this phone call, and, and the guy says, is this John Hodges? Said, yes, it is. He goes, this is Jonathan David Brown. I'm like, yeah, right, okay. No, really, who is this? And No, it's really Jonathan David Brown. And I was like, yeah, okay, man. You got me. This is good. Who is it really? This is really, okay. <laughs> Greg Volz told me to call you, and he's doing a record, and he wanted me to call you, see if you would come sing backups on it for him and i'm like mr brown i'm so sorry i didn't know it was you i really honestly thought it was one of my crazy friends and i'm just and he's like oh, it's okay it's okay i got crazy friends too so i wound up singing on the uh, exodus record uh, there's a song set up to take a fall that's one that we did uh, the other one was uh, he's a man overboard that was one that i sang with greg and, and of course your albums are done all over the place and you know you just take the masters with you to the next location nowadays you just upload the files it's crazy what you can do now but like duncan and i laugh about it you know, it's back in the days when we had to sing on pitch ah, yeah no imagine that no auto tune but, right uh, <laughs> yeah they didn't have any auto tune so anyway of course i was in heaven dude you talk about being in heaven standing right here with my hero one of my vocal heroes greg bolson and singing on his record? Come on, man. You know, there's only two people that were ever invited to do that. Matthew Ward and Mark Farner, which both I have, you know, extreme admiration for. But anyway, I, I came out of the vocal booth. I'm just on cloud nine. And Jonathan Bra David Brown looks over. He's at the control panel. He looks over and he goes, that was the closest vocal I've ever heard to Greg's voice. And I'm like, <laughs> Stick a fork in me, baby. I'm done. I'm, done. You know, I'm, I'm, done. You know, I'm good. Take that to the mat, baby. It's the two greatest compliments I ever received was that one. And we were doing a show somewhere, I think down in South Texas. And somebody, you know, said, when did y'all get the lead singer from Allies? I'm like, <laughs> thank oh. you. I don't know who you are, but 
where do I write my check to? But yeah, yeah Bobby was, and, and I got to meet him later too, by the way, which was cool. But yeah, I started meeting people. And, and I tell you where it really turned for me, Scott, was when uh, I went to, I attended Christ Church mm -hmm. and fell in love with the choir. I'm just an amazing choir there. And one of their soloists was Michael English at the time. And another soloist was Jonathan Hildreth, which went later went on by Jonathan Pierce. Guy Penrod was singing with them. I mean, there was just some really great singers in that, that choir. And, and so I said, you know what? I'm going to join the choir. So I joined the choir. And Landy Gardner, the founder and director of the choir, said, uh, I would like for you to audition for the, the solo on it. And I'm like, wow, dude, that's great. Mm -hmm. I've only been with a choir for six months. You know, some people are with a choir for six years and never get a solo. And so I'm like, okay. So I audition. He goes, you're the man. He said, I want you to wow. rewrite the second verse. And I'm like, dude, Jerome Olds wrote this song. I can't rewrite that. He goes, and just give it a shot. So I did. And, and uh, that went on to get a final round, by the way, Grammy nomination that year. We got a Dove nomination for that one. And it was just, dude, that was Camelot back in those days. That was Camelot. Michael English was making the big rise. And, and uh, just, dude, my time at Christchurch was magical. Because I was a member of the choir and because I was rubbing shoulders with so many great singers, they invited me into a, a, a um, I guess you call it a studio group. It's, a, it's kind of like a consortium of regulars, you know, for studio work. Mm -hmm. And I started doing a ton of sessions, man. I sang that year just to drop names. So you know who I'm talking about, but most people are like, who? But uh, I sang on, of course, we sang on the, the Judd stuff. I did uh, Carmen's record, Addicted to Jesus. We were, I sang on that record. I sang on uh, Glenn Campbell's record, Show Me Your Way, which was a huge honor. And we did Praise Gathering up there with Gaither. And, and I had to follow Lauren L. Harris. I wanted to punch him in the throat because... He did such an amazing job right before I had to sing. And I was like, oh, thanks a lot. You know? We did a lot of traveling. We did, did a lot of gigs. And we, we lost out on the Grammy that year. There was a new group, a new choir called the Sounds of Blackness. And that was their first year to do a record. And they won the Grammy. So we missed it by that much. I think it had been a year earlier. We probably would have won the Grammy because it was wow. it's a great record. Tom Henby produced it. Phil Christensen, rest his soul. He's in heaven now. But uh, just some great guys worked on that. Of course, we had the who's who on that, too. Our sound man at church was Guy Penrod. And uh, and he worked with Larry Strickland, which was Naomi Judd's husband. And that was our connection to the Judds and everything. And But, yeah, we just, yeah, that was Camelot. And then summer camp. Check this out. Summer camp. There's, there's a 5,000-member church. So we got, like, 200 kids at camp. And so nice. We had the whole camp. Just Christ Church. And I was a counselor there. <laughs> Imagine that. But uh, it was so much fun. I'm Cooper Brothers, Todd and Bo Cooper, they were there as counselors. Michael English was there as a counselor. Joey Gardner. And the worship team, okay, check this out. The worship team, the, the, the band was basically the Imperials band. Uh, it was Bo Cooper, Todd Cooper, Tom Hemby, all these guys that played with the Imperials and stuff. I'm just a, Gary Lund, Whiteheart, just a bunch of guys that were incredible musicians. And the worship team, though, the singers were the three of us. It was Michael English, Joy Gardner, and myself. And you talk about nervous. You talk about, dude, I was puckered every time <laughs> I sang because I was so afraid I was going to do something wrong because yeah. these guys are amazing. And, and so we just, we had so much fun. And Michael, during camp that, that week, last night of camp, he says, I've got a new song. And, and I used to tease Mikey all the time how he talked. He's like, got a new song. I'm going to do it tonight. And I'll probably mess up the lyrics because I just recorded it this week. And my buddy is here tonight that wrote the song. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. And, and he kicked in a Mary, did you know? And that was the first time that song was ever sang in public. Wow. And I'm standing at the back of the auditorium. Mark Lowry standing right next to me. And I looked at him and I said, you're lying. You did not write that, you half-wit. And, and he said, no, I, I wrote it. He said, I wrote the lyrics. He said, Buddy Green did the music. I said, Mark, that is one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. You know, did a lot of sessions with Maranatha back then. And one night, one of the artists from the 80s and 90s that I think didn't get near the duty he really had coming was Roby Duke. 
And they told us that night at one of the sessions we were doing, they said, oh, yeah, the producer tonight would like you to meet him, Roby Duke. And I'm like, well, what? And so that was really cool. And, uh, of course, we worked with Brown Bannister when he did the Michael English record and stuff because I sang on uh, Battle My Knees and Cried Holy. And Michael went back into the studio and redid that one. And it was on a Wednesday night, I'll never forget, after choir rehearsal. Hey, man, we're going to go sing on Mikey's record. You want to come? I'm like, are you kidding? Heck yeah. <laughs> so there's like 12 of us. We went in and we laid all the vocals down on that, stacked them and stacked them, made them sound you know, like the choir. So, it was just, yeah, it was really cool. And, and being at GMA and stuff, I got to meet a lot of people. I got to sing backups for Brian Duncan on a Ain't No Stopping Now. That was a lot of fun. Hey guys, you talk, you think I'm ADD. Oh, Lord Jesus. <laughs> But uh, he's all over the place, but yeah. that's why we get along so well. And it's like the uh, the trifecta is myself, him, and Florian in a room together. That's scary. Wow. Dude, man, you had, you know, you keep referring to this as Camelot, and I could see where you were just in your element. And I know that didn't last forever, but let me ask you this. If you were to maybe make a, a list of the top five experiences you had, and I'd love to come back and maybe tell some of these stories, but I've got one photo that I've been intrigued by that I'd like to pull up right now. I know there's something there. So I'm going to pull that up. You're going to tell me what that's about. And then maybe we can wrap this part up by you telling us a little bit about what that was like and maybe some of the, the most memorable people you got to meet that really left an impression on you. So here's the photograph. And this is like reverence for Scott and I. Okay. So this is at the top of our list. So tell us how in the world you got to meet this guy and what that was like. I actually met his sister. This is going to sound funny, but we were getting our hair done at the same place in Nashville. And yeah, we were talking and her name's Kathy, very sweet lady. And she, uh, she said, yeah, my brother's in the music business. This is really cool. What does he do? She said, well, he's a songwriter. I said, really, really? And uh, has he done anything I might recognize? And she goes, oh yeah, he's written several songs. And uh, I'm like, gotta, okay. let's put that in context. When you're in Nashville, that I mean, any person that's bringing you your food, that's washing your car, that's your Uber, is all got. Yeah, I'm, I got us in the music business. So, in your defense, that's an everyday occurrence. You hear it all go the ahead. Time. You hear it all the time. And the funny part was, is, um, she said this, and I'm like, okay, that's cool. I said, any anything that. Uh, and by the way, one of the jokes we had in Nashville was, I find a really good writer. Check please. But anyway, <clears throat> so we're sitting, and she said, yeah, he's written some songs. I said, well. I said, what, is there anything I would recognize? She said, well, some songs he wrote for the Doobie Brothers. And she'd already said, my my brother, Michael. And then I started connecting dots, and I'm thinking, no, there's no way this is Michael McDonald's sister. And sure enough, it was. And, uh, of course, she didn't, she's married, so she had the name Kathy Walker, but really sweet lady. But anyway, uh, several years past, this picture you're showing was just from, couple of years ago and uh, he came through Tyler and I got a call from Hemby from Tom Hemby and which is the guy that wrote power of God for the Imperials and he's written a ton of other songs but and by the way I, I taught his daughter in Sunday school Natalie Hemby when she was like 14 this was back in 1990 91 and uh, she went on to be a writer and she wrote the song pontoon for little big town and White Liar with Miranda Lambert. Uh, Hemby calls me up and he says, hey, man, uh, my buddy Mark Douthat is uh, touring with Michael McDonald. And they're coming through Tyler, Texas, which is about 45 miles from where I live, and, and said, uh, would you like to meet Michael? I'm like, does a bear do things in the woods that we don't talk about on a Christian broadcast? <laughs> and he said, uh, he's going to be coming through. Let me see what I can swing. And uh, he calls me back. He goes, yeah, Douthat said, come on out and He'll walk you in the, the backstage door and everything, VIP pass and, and all that. So I got to hang out with him that night and just a, a sweet man and a very genuine person. He wasn't heady at all. He didn't take himself too seriously. And I've just always had a tremendous respect for him. Even, you know, you can't understand a thing he's saying in the songs, but it doesn't matter because he just sounds like that. It's you know? <laughs> like, who is the Robert Irving? <laughs> Uh, what did he say? I don't know, but it sure sounded good. Sure yeah. sounded good, man. Sure yeah. sounded it's like good. Carlisle has a line that he used to say. He says, well, I'll sing it, but it ain't going to sound good. <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to try to get him on our CCM Legacy cast, please let us know. It would be like my highlight of my life because I've sure. been a Doobie sure. Brothers fan for yeah. my entire life. Huge Michael yeah. McDonald fan. Huge. He's just a sweet Big. guy. I was so glad because... 
a lot of these guys you meet and they're just complete jerks. And, and I was so glad that he wasn't, you yeah. know, and, and he's just a really sweet guy. But most people like that. I know I was at a uh, Christmas party out at Brian Lennox's house. And uh, Lennox produced, go west, young man. Ba-da-da-da-da-da. Anyway, for Smitty. Yes. And so, yeah, it's a garage. And there's like probably 80 people packed in this garage. And I bumped into a guy next to me and I said, oh, man, I'm sorry. I turned to apologize. It was Michael W. Smith. That's, that was the kind of people you know, I was around all the time, just hanging out. And I remember I was backstage at one show and it was a CMA thing and, and Russ Taft's over in the corner and nobody knew who he was. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's Taft, man. You got to go say hi. And so I went over and just visited with him and I had just done a video with him. I'd run the, the monitors for it. Uh, Becky Volz, as a matter of fact, see, there's that connection again. She called me up. She says, uh, you want to come spend the day on a train with Russ Taft and, and run monitors? And I'm like, Pfft. and so I showed up and we spent the whole day. And anybody that knows me knows I'm a huge train fan. So Russ Taft and trains, I'm in. So we spent the whole day doing life is like a mountain railroad. And that was a hoot, man. That was so much fun. What a ride. But, one of these days when it's just your grandkids that are out there, what is it that you would want people to know about John Hodge? How would you like to be remembered? He's a guy that kept trying and he actually learned. It's real cliche to say, live, love, laugh, leave a legacy and all that stuff. But dude, honestly, I want them to, I hope my life truly points to the love of Jesus and you just accept his love. Don't accept all the fear that, that so much of religion, I'm not going to say Christianity, but so much of religion puts on you because it's not worth it, man. That's all noise. There's, if you want to, if you want to listen to noise, you can, but if you want to listen to the still small voice, that still small voice is constantly saying, I love you. Mm-hmm. And I gave myself for you. And there's nobody that I love more than you. And that's what I want my grandkids to know. I want them to know that Papa John loved them. I love them very much. But it's just Jesus loves them so much. God loves them so much. That's what I want to be remembered by. I mean, a guy that, that, that was fun to be around, that made people laugh, that, that was the, the life of the party, so to speak. And we'll just continue that on. Many people that say life's short, they're not considering eternity. You know, we're just warming up for the big show. (laughs) One of the things we talk about and that we're all passionate about is the Christian walk. If we sell it as a bill of goods that you're never going to be sad again, nothing ever bad is going to happen to you. We haven't really talked about a lot of the struggles you went through. And part of what makes you such a amazing person in my life is how you shared that just that I hung on, that I kept going and I never gave up. And so I just want to give you that opportunity to share uh, maybe with future generations or with the audience, whoever's listening to this right now, who may be thinking, I just, I'm ready to pack it in. You know what, sure. God, I just felt like gay, I was given this gift and I don't know mm-hmm. if it's really been worth it. And what is all this for? And maybe there's really not a God. And so how does John respond to somebody with it said, I just, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it. And how did you make it through when you had to have just wanted to give to given up? wanted to give up at some point. I'm not going to say that it doesn't sting sometimes when I see my friends going on and doing what I love doing so much. Physically, I'm not able to do that anymore. I was having that conversation with, with my good buddy the other day about that, and he toured for forever and, and on a much larger scale than even we toured. But I said, do you ever miss it? He goes, yeah, I miss the interaction with the crowds. And the people and all that, but the traveling, no, I don't miss any of that. But sometimes it's a little bittersweet because some of my friends are still physically able to keep that schedule and to tour and to to have fun. And, and I, I'm glad for them. I'm not, I, I don't want to take anything away from them. I'm glad they're able to do that. But, but as far as as far as keeping the faith, man, I've I would tell everyone that show up for the gig, just like I told you earlier. It's, that's what the old man told me. Just show up. Life is about showing up and be in the moment. Be with your family. Be with your loved ones. If you're worshiping, be in that moment. Just every night when I used to stand on stage and sing the worship songs that we did, I just I literally would try to block out all the noise, all the smoke, all the lights, all the sound, everything. And I just tried to focus completely 
on Jesus sitting on the throne and him looking down at me with eyes of love and compassion. And, and that was hard for me to do because that's before I really had an understanding of who Jesus really is and who he is in my life and what he is now in my life. But man, there's just don't give up. Hang in there. You're worth it. God loves you. He gave his most valued, precious thing that he could give his son for you. And wear that with a badge of honor. Wear the name Christian with a badge of honor. And don't, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to make mistakes. I mean, you're going to go through hard times. It's not a ticket out of this life. Jesus even promised in this life, you will have tribulation. He didn't say, yeah, you may have a few ups and downs. No, he said, you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. And, dude, that's just, you know, like I said, we're just warming up for the big game. This is just, a, this is not even a, hardly a semifinal, you know. It's going to be huge when we get to the, the big house. Jesus pulls down in his GMC truck. He says, come on, y'all. Hop in the truck. Let's go up to the big house. So that's how I pictured it in my redneck world. Wow. I'm with you on Yeehaw! that. Exactly. <laughs> Man, just so well said, so well spoken, and so well lived. Just such an inspiration. And I know there's people out there that, they have aspirations and dreams of, of taking what gift God's given them. And you've been through it. And I know you've struggled and come out the other side. And I know that's going to be a legacy that your kids and your grandkids so. look up to. So. Scott, uh, anything else you want to add? I, I was just thinking about the legacy he wanted to leave was to be somebody that's fun and, and people like to be around. And gosh, John, it's been a lot of fun. And I've really enjoyed being around you today. Thank you for the blessing that you've been. And thank you for the, the blessing your life has been to so many people. It's very much appreciate what you I done. also want to add to this. John has been uh, responsible for bringing a lot of amazing artists to our show. And, and so please reach out and thank him for that. Yeah. He's going to be involved behind the scenes. And I'm looking forward to bringing him back multiple times to tell stories and to introduce us new people. So if uh, please it. encourage John, uh, if you want to reach out to him, you can probably catch him on social media at John E. Texas. And also, so um, I'm sorry, it's Johnny Texan. I'm sorry, Texan. I told you on the uh, I probably wrote it wrong. T-E-X-A-N, <laughs> Johnny Texan. Ted, Johnny Texan. All right, very good. And also, please pass the word around. Send this video to other folks. Share it. Please pass on the word. Like and subscribe. Do all that stuff. It'll help promote what we're doing so that we can keep doing it and get more people to uh, be exposed to some incredible people like Johnny. And if they want to go so. to, if they want to go to few, uh, YouTube, they can find us. If you want to put that address up there, Chris, because I sent it to you, I finally got it to you. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, Paradise Music gets up there on, on We'll YouTube. get that added. And with your blessing, I'd like to uh, end with one of your tunes. People get a chance to hear your voice, and we'll try to do that as the show closes. John, thank you so much. Blessings on you. Looking forward to where God's going to take you and take all of us in the near future, buddy. Take care. Keep Thanks, rocking. Thanks, guys. God bless Appreciate you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye-bye.